Let's pray now for God's word and we get to hear what he says from 1 Timothy 4. Our Father, we are humbled by the fact that you have chosen us and you have placed us here, right here in the north, right here at CBC. And that through this church, you have done wonders in many, many places. We cannot count how many people have come through this church and are now serving in many other churches. If we were to all stay to stay here, we know that we would not have the impact that you are having right now through your people in so many different places. And for that, Lord, we are grateful that we can be used by you. Thank you for prayer yesterday. Thank you for a Bible study that was held at Southern Gateway. Thank you for William and Sharon in Zimbabwe. Thank you for Franz and Anneli in the Nata. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to pursue church planting, to pursue church strengthening, and to pursue revitalization. Thank you for Christ Seminary, in that we are able to train men to place them on these pulpits. God, you are amazing. We are amazed that you could choose us right here to do this. Each one of us here involved in this, we give you praise. Thank you for the leaders in this church that you have raised to lead these different ministries. And thank you for the congregation that gives to these ministries, that encourages, that loves and interacts. We worship you, for you deserve it, Lord. I want to pray even now through the ministry of your word. Will you use me to speak to your congregation? For we seek to know you and to grow in you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. First Timothy chapter 4. We go back to verses 11 to 16. I want to read those verses again. As I stood here last week, I thought I would... I should say, when I first prepared this sermon, I thought that by last week I would have done with chapter 4, but I couldn't really glance through verse 12. So we had to spend our time last week really in verse 12. So we will today just go through all these verses and again look at the exemplary life of a good servant of God. That's the theme we started last week in these verses. The exemplary life of a good servant of Christ Jesus. And from these verses, verse 11 to verse 16, I told you that the Apostle Paul gives us at least eight commands, gives Timothy specifically eight commands. And uh, as we looked at these eight commands, it's easy for us to look at each one at a time but I decided to summarize it in four headings that are more applicable to us as we are still faithful to the text. And I summarized these commands in four qualities of a respectable minister or servant of God. Four qualities of a respectable minister of God. Now, I pointed out last week that in verse 11... Paul reminds Timothy he has authority to give orders. As a minister of Christ in the church, Timothy is given authority from God, by God, to give orders and to instruct in the church. We see that in verse 11 when he says, prescribe and teach these things. Those are words that carry with them authority that God gives to ministers in the church of God. However, as we have seen, Timothy's usefulness or youthfulness was an impediment to his exercise of authority. This would become a hindrance, especially in the culture where they looked down on the youth or on young people and young ministers. So his youthfulness would be an impediment. Not that there's anything wrong with Timothy, but it's because of the influence of the culture in the the way they viewed young people and young uh, ministers. Will they listen to Timothy? 
as he prescribes and teaches these things. Well, Paul says, Timothy, this need not to be an impediment. Your youthfulness should not be on your way. You cannot change your age. You cannot change who you are. But there's something you can do in order to win respect, in order to earn respect from the listeners, from the church. And that's where we see in verse 12, where Paul says to Timothy, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Timothy, your exemplary lifestyle is what will earn you respect in the church. And you will be able to prescribe and instruct if you pay attention to your life. If you lead believers by example, they will, that, that will offset their despising, their contempt, their disrespect of you, and actually it will give you a voice. And emphasis was on the quality of our lives as ministers, but not only as ministers, each one who wants to bring God's word, everyone who comes with the authority of God's word, need to be sure that takes care of you, what he says with his mouth, what he, how he lives, his behavior, his conduct, the way he relates in love and his faithfulness or trust in God, and also the sexual purity that we looked at. So those are five areas Timothy had to work on and to grow in in order to earn respect from the church. And so our first quality we looked at then last week was that uh, a respectable minister of Christ sets an example for believers. A respectable minister of Christ sets an example for believers. Now, as I went through this passage again and trying to discern how the commands given to Timothy relate, because it's, when you read, like I said, it's easy to just look at each command individually, and one can do that. It's easy for me to have eight sermons out of this, given all these commands. But there should be a thread. There should be something that really knit this together. And I try to discern what that could be that knit all these commands together. And my observation is that Paul carries on with the idea of being an example throughout these commands. And so... Our title is The Exemplary Life of a Good Servant of God, looking from verses 11 to 16. So exemplary life seems to permeate all these verses. It is the theme that runs through these verses. Now, let me convince you of that. How do I see that? Well, you will notice as you read these verses that Timothy's life is under scrutiny. It's scrutinized by people. Look at verse 12, he speaks about how Timothy's life is going to affect people. He says, let no one look down on your youthfulness. So there are people who are looking at Timothy. So Timothy's life is affecting people. But not only that, he gives this now as a solution, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. Do you see people there again? You have people who are looking at Timothy. You have believers that Timothy is to set example for. So that's what we see. But that does not end there. I want you to look down at verse 15 as well, and you will see that Timothy's life is all about people watching him. Verse 15. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Timothy, people are watching how you are doing. Are you a growing minister? If they are going to respect you, if they are going to stop to look down on your youthfulness, they want to be sure that there is veterans, there is progress in your life. So people are watching Timothy's example. And we see the same about people in verse 16. 
Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So there are people listening to Timothy. So you can see that this is all about Timothy's exemplary lifestyle. It depends on how Timothy is going to live his life in what he teaches and in, what he, in who he is. He is going to affect the lives of all these people. So that's a minister's life. He's called to be an example. And people are watching. Now, to apply this passage to us, last week we asked two battle questions. Two questions. First, for Timothy, how can Timothy earn the respect of the church? I think every minister here in our midst should be asking that question. If you know that there are things that people could use to look down on you, the question is how can you as a minister earn the respect of your church, of those who are watching your life? So we will answer that question for ministers. But also I want to ask Another question for the church. What should the church look for in a minister if they're going to call one or if they're going to follow one? What should the church look for in a minister? Now, we saw last week that they should look for a minister whose life is exemplary. A minister who knows how to control his tongue. A minister who takes care of his actions and his behavior. A minister who ministers with love. A minister who is faithful. A minister who will continue to conduct himself in purity. Especially sexual purity as Timothy is instructed in 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee the lusts of the youth or youthful lusts. That's what he's called to. So a respectable minister sets an example for believers, and he will be respected for that. Secondly, now we come to our second quality of this minister. What should we be looking for in a minister, and how can a minister earn respect? Well, a respectable minister devotes himself to his ministry. That's what we're going to see in verses 13 to 15. A respectable minister devotes himself to his ministry. So church, if you are going to call a minister or you are going to assess a minister, look at his devotion to the ministry of the word more specifically. Is this the man who is committed and devoted and he gives his all to word, God's word? Verse 13 to 15, let's read those verses. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. We can stop there for now. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, we know of the apostles and their ministry that was growing in the early stages of the church. We know of the problems that came in the church where there were fights over the resources, limited resources. And at that time, the apostles realized they were the ones uh, who are having to take care of all this administration. It was actually just sucking their energy and they could not pay attention to what they're supposed to do. And so, in calling the church and talking to them, they made this clear, that as apostles, as the ministers called by God, they were to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. That's what ministers are called to do. That's their ministry. Ministers are called to devote themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 here, we see emphasis on the public reading of scripture, the exhortation and the teaching of it in verse 13. 
So the church then must look for devotion to God's word and ministry in any minister. And at the same time, this quality will earn respect for the minister. We saw that in verse 12, youthfulness was a potential hindrance to Timothy's teaching ministry. But his exemplary life overcomes that hindrance. In verse 14, we find another potential hindrance to ministry, and that is neglecting the call to ministry. Look at verse 14 again. Paul says to Timothy, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. That's a potential hindrance to Timothy's ministry is if he's not going to take care, if he's not going to focus or pay attention to the ministry God has called him to and neglecting the call to ministry. Now, what is the solution to this problem? I think verse 13 is the solution. If you are a minister and you find yourself to be neglecting your calling, your ministry, we find a solution to that in verse 13. And this is what ministers ought to do, and that comes to the devotion. Paul says, until I come, meaning that he's planning to come to Ephesus. But until then, Timothy, you should not stop doing what you're supposed to do in ministry. Give attention. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. So now... I want to ask you this question, which I think it may not be a shock, because we are observable people. But I won't go to ask it anymore. Anyway, did you know that some ministers quit ministry? Did you know that there are pastors who quit ministry? Well, yes. Unfortunately, that's often a reality of pastors quitting ministry. However, I was encouraged when I did some research and looked at some reliable uh, polls, people who are really taking polls on ministers and so on, so surveying them. Barna and Lifeway are one of, uh, two of the major uh, within the Christian circles, those who are surveying pastors in ministry and so on. I was encouraged by both of them because they stated that majority of pastors stay in ministry. Praise God. Yes, there are those who leave ministry, but these pollsters tell us that majority of pastors stay in ministry. And when these pastors who stay in ministry were asked why they are choosing to stay, even with all the difficulties of ministry, the answer given by these pastors was they wanted to fulfill their calling. They wanted to fulfill their calling. And that's what we see Paul is saying to Timothy here. Do not neglect your calling. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, Timothy. Continue even in the midst of hardship to Carry out your ministry in the church. And I should say to each one of us here, such ministers who stick it out should be respected and encouraged by a congregation. Amen? I speak for ministers now. They should be respected and encouraged by the church. Church family, if you want to be encouraged and you want to grow, and you want to benefit for your ministers, be their great encouragers. I was encouraged yesterday by Uncle Merv. He came here this, yesterday, and we were talking, and he says, man, I was reading in Hebrews, and I found that actually I've got such a responsibility towards you guys, and that's what he said, towards the ministers here. And as we were praying, by the way, he read that passage from Hebrews 13, 17. How the church is to, to, to relate to the ministers uh, so that they can serve you with joy. That's what we need in the church. Man, I hate it when I hear that churches and pastors are fighting. I don't think that's how God has put his church together. That seems to be the norm out there. I don't want to be in a church where I'm always fought. <laughs> 
Amen, church family? Because we're not going to go anywhere. I speak for ministers anywhere. Now, so far, in our study of 1 Timothy, you have seen that Timothy's work was not an easy one. He had to confront false teachers who loved to be known as teachers of the law. In chapter 1, verse 7, we saw that. He had to order worship in the church and make sure only qualified elders and deacons lead the church in chapter 3. Add to that the reality of people who claimed to be believers and are now falling away from the faith only to follow demonic teaching and religions. We saw that in the opening verses of chapter 4. Timothy, at this point, has already experienced suffering and persecution because of the ministry God called him to. And it also seems Paul wrote this letter, 1 Timothy, to Timothy because Timothy wanted to leave ministry. We find that idea in chapter 1, verse 3, where Paul says, As I urged you, Paul, Timothy, remain on, continue, don't leave. I urged you when I left for Macedonia, remain, continue there, don't leave. It's not time to leave ministry yet or to leave that church yet. Yes, it was difficult in this church. Now, with all these pressures mounting for Timothy, you will see why Paul exhorts Timothy not to neglect his gift in verse 40. And this will not be the last time Paul tells Timothy not to neglect his gift. He will do the same in 2 Timothy 1.6, where he reminds him again to kindle afresh the gift of God in him. And that's again in the midst of pressure and persecution. So ministers will go through that, but they need to devote themselves to the ministry God has called them to, the gift that God has given them. Now, the next question I want to ask is, what was Timothy's gift? What was Timothy's gift that he was to kindle? What was Timothy's gift that he was not to neglect? Well, Timothy knew God called him to teach God's word. Where do I find that? Because the commands that Paul gives to Timothy are related to teaching. We saw in verse 6, in pointing out these things, you will be a faithful minister of Christ Jesus. We saw that in chapter 1, where Paul says, you, I left you there so that you will not allow any man to teach strange doctrine. We see it in verse 11 where he says to him, prescribe and teach these things. And on and on, Timothy will be reminded he's called to teach God's word. That's the gift God has given him. Here in verse 13, until I come, give attention to public reading of scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Now look at this in a contrast of chapter 4 verse 1. That while some were paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, Timothy was to pay attention to the public reading of Scripture. Timothy, don't be swayed. Don't follow them. Don't be taken by the waves. Stick with the Bible. Stay with God's Word. And this verb, to pay attention or to devote, means that Timothy was to occupy himself with the scriptures. He was to read them in public and explain them so that people can apply them. He was to teach them. Whether it's in a small group or in a big group or to individuals, Timothy, whenever you find opportunities to minister to people, stick to the Bible, stick to the scriptures, explain and exhort. That's the devotion of a minister of God's word. He is called to do that. And Paul says, remember that this was given to you by the laying on of hands. It was affirmed that you are called to this Timothy. So that's the first, or I should say the second in our thread of commands here, a second quality of a minister. And if the church is going to look for a minister, it needs to look for someone who devotes himself to his ministry of the word, but also to ministers here. If you're going to earn respect from the church, be known as a minister who is devoted to the Bible. And people ask me, how do I order my ministry here at CBC? I always think about my ministry in two ways. My ministry is on this pulpit and is in your homes. <laughs> 
why get to come and minister to you God's way. I tell people, office is a means to the pulpit and to your homes. Because I'm not called to be in the office and enjoy air conditioning, but I'm called to God's word. And I need to be sure it gets to you. That should be the devotion of every minister. Thirdly, a respectable minister shows progress. Now I say thirdly because we started last week. The first point was last week. So this is the third point. A respectable minister shows progress. Verse 15. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. I think you can see where the point comes from. A respectable minister is the one who is progressing. Now, what are these things? He says, take pains with these things. And he also says that you be absorbed in them. What are these things and what are them? Well, these things, in, uh, I think, is what we read in verses 12 to 14. The exemplary life and the devotion to the ministry of the word and the gift that is not supposed to neglect. So the goal then of Paul's exhortation in verse 15 is so that Timothy's progress may be evident to all people who are watching him. Remember that he is a young man who had to earn respect by showing himself an example for believers. He had to devote himself to his calling of teaching God's word instead of neglecting his gift. Now to show yourself an example and to devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and exhortation and teaching and to not neglect your gift is not an easy once-off discipline. It should be an ongoing discipline. It is a lifetime commitment that will require constant practice or cultivation of such disciplines. So the goal then in all of this is to grow, is to make progress. And we can go back to the area of progress. In speech, Timothy, be known to be growing. You don't speak like you used to do. You have matured in your speech. In conduct, Timothy, as people watch your behavior, let people show that you conduct yourself in what You are progressing in your sanctification. You are maturing in your love, in the way that you minister and treat people. You are more loving. You are more like a First, Timothy, First Corinthians 13 personalized love. Your trust in God, your faith in God. Let it be shown by how you keep on trusting God. You are no longer this moaning young man, Timothy, but you trust God. Your sexual purity, let it be evident in the way that you relate with people of opposite sex, Timothy. And that Timothy should be making progress in this, even in his devotion. So ministers who are respectable are those who take their lives and their ministry seriously and they progress. And for them to do that, they are not passive, but they are active. Paul says to him, take pains in these things. Be absorbed in them. That verb, take pains, carries an idea of improving by care or study. So it means that we are to improve either by caring for something or by studying as ministers. So the key word is improve. Because the goal is evident progress that can be witnessed by all who are watching your life. This reminds us again that a Christian life is not lived in a closet. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I know that emphasis is on ministers here, but remember verse 12. What Timothy was to be, the church must be as well, because he is to set example for believers. If Timothy is going to devote himself to the scriptures, the church must learn from Timothy and do the same. If Timothy is going to take pains and be absorbed in these things, the church should do the same. So in other words, then, each of us here, we sh should be evidencing growth in our lives as Christians. 
So be absorbed, take pains, make that your goal, Timothy, so that this will be evident to everyone who is watching your life. So progress, then, is what should be expected of any minister. Growth is what we expect. And maybe let me say this again to each one of us here. And it comes back to encouragement. If you see a fellow believer growing, will you go and let them know that you are actually seeing that? You notice Paul says this should be evident to all. It means we have to be watching each other. And I should be able to say, man, I can see that there is growth in your life. You used to be such a coward when it comes to prayer, but now you cannot be stopped. Right? It's just an example of that. I don't know if we have any of those in here. <laughs> but that's what we do, is that progress of saying, I'm not timid anymore. I don't talk the way I talk anymore. I do not go to those places I used to go to anymore. And as we see that, we should encourage one another and say, I can see that. Keep on going. The Lord is at work. Paul writes to Timothy to encourage him. We see a number of times in Scripture where Paul says of Timothy, I have no one else of kindred spirit who genuinely is concerned for your welfare. He says that to the Philippians. He says to the Corinthians about Timothy as he sends him to them, he says, this is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. That's an encouragement. For Timothy in saying, Paul is watching my life, and he is, can tell there is progress. And that's what we need. We progress in our lives as believers, and we grow. So that's another quality we need to be looking at in a minister, is that growth. Is he progressing in his life and in his teaching ministry? Lastly, a respectful minister cares about souls. A respectable minister cares about souls. And this is the kind of minister you need in your church. You need as believers. is one who is concerned about souls. Where do I get that? Look at verse 16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. The reason, Timothy, is that you should ensure salvation. He explains why Timothy is to pay close attention to himself and to his teaching and why he should be persevering in those two things. For as you do this, Timothy, if this is your practice, you will save. That's actually the literal reading there. You will save yourself and you will save those who are hearing you. That's caring for souls. Salvation is about souls. There is, it, upon Timothy, it seems there is this, uh, this responsibility for his soul and for the soul of others. And that's what ministers are called to do. Hebrews 13 says the same, that you, are, you as the church are to obey your leaders. Why? It says because they keep watch over your souls. Ministers are called to do that, to keep watch over your souls. And how are they going to do that? Their lives and their teachings should not cause you to lose your souls. So ministers have a responsibility. In this, we will see that ministers are a means for salvation. God uses ministers to preserve his people, to protect his people, particularly their souls. As I was looking at this verse 16, it poses a number of difficulties when you read it. Um, especially, number one, since we know that salvation does not belong to Timothy. He has no power to save himself or to save anyone. Salvation belongs to God through Christ Jesus, who gave his life as a ransom for many. We know that salvation only belongs to him. We are saved through Christ alone. So how, then, does God place this responsibility on Timothy Timothy? 
that he will ensure salvation both for himself and for those who hear you. Now, as you study this, this might, you may be tempted to think that maybe Paul is saying to Timothy, since there are these demonic teachings, you will preserve or you will protect yourself so we can understand salvation in that way in terms of preserving and protecting people from falling away because of all these demonic teachings. But I, do, I don't think we should be running away from the fact that this word salvation is salvific. That means that it has to do with people being saved. Salvation as we understand it, saved by God from his wrath, from sin, and so on. So then how is it that Timothy becomes responsible for his life and the life of those who are hearing him? Now I think the key word, the word is persevere there. Look at that word again in verse 16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. That word perseverance is important for us. How so? Well, the Bible teaches that only those who will persevere to the end will be saved. Matthew 24, verse 13. Only those who persevere to the end will be saved. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Again, and I want to draw your attention to Romans, so you may want to listen as I just cross-reference there, because Romans 11 uses the similar word that Paul uses here of persevere in 1 Timothy 4.16. In Romans 11, verse 22 to 23, we have these words from the Apostle Paul. It says, Behold, then, the kindness and severity of God to those who fail severity. Now, if you think of Romans 11, it's all about God's election and distinction between the Jews and the Greeks and how the Jews did not actually listen to the message of salvation so as to be saved by faith. And because of that, that's the severity of their falling. What does God do? The Bible says he grafts in the Gentiles in their place. Now, that's the context there. So it says, behold then the kindness and severity of God. He has both, kindness and severity. To those who fail, severity. But to you, and these are those who believe, God's kindness. But there's a condition to this kindness. It says, if you continue, and that's the word perseverance. If you persevere in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue or if they do not persevere in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. What do we have here? We have what we call the doctrine of perseverance. Doctrine of perseverance means remaining in the faith or remaining a Christian until the end. And it is only those who will persevere to the end who are truly born again Christians. We're not sure if everyone is going to persevere, everyone who has professed is going to persevere to the end. So Timothy's responsibility was to pay close attention to his life and to the teaching to persevere in paying that attention to his life and teaching. For as you do this, Timothy, as you teach what is right, and as you set example with your life for believers, you will save yourself, and you will save others who hear you. So Timothy then is a means that God uses to save others and also his life. How so? As he will encourage perseverance to the end. And so believers will persevere to the end. So a respectable minister then cares about souls. He thinks, he is always absorbed by what, how is so-and-so doing? I see this 
throughout the scripture with Paul's care. He leaves Thessalonica and he is concerned and he sends back uh, one of his ministers in Thessalonica, go and find out because I am afraid we might have labored in vain. So Paul is so much concerned for the souls of these professing believers. Why? Because he knows that it is only those who persevere to the end who will be saved. But with that, as we come to the close, we should be reminded and we should be worshipful in that even in our perseverance, he keeps us. Amen? Because we cannot keep ourselves. But we know that God who started this good work in us, he's the one who will bring it to completion. So our salvation depends on God. But ministers are called to make sure that with our lives and with our teaching, we are not hindrances to those who would be saved. So Timothy, how can you end respect? Well, devote yourself to the reading and explaining and teaching of God's word. And as you notice, that responsibility requires time to prepare and to study. So Timothy, be absorbed by scripture. Study them accurately in order to apply them as you teach them. Timothy, as a minister who will earn respect, cultivate a disciplined lifestyle so that your progress can be evident. You can progress in your spiritual disciplines. And Timothy, care for souls. Be concerned about souls. Watch your life and teaching because your life and teaching affect people and souls. And I pray that we will be such ministers at CBC. You will encourage that in CBC, but also that you will look for these kinds of ministers to save you. Let's thank God for those that the Lord has given us. God, we thank you for ministers in this church that you have given us. Thank you, O oh God, for the elders in Pastor Charlie, Pastor Andrew, Pastor William, Pastor uh, Mark, as he shepherds as well. I thank you, Lord, that you have called all these shepherds in this church to shepherd the flock. And I know that whenever we meet we are all always concerned about this flock. And help us, Lord, to shepherd well as exemplary. Life, in our examples uh, before them, Lord, that we will be those uh, exemplary models to them, that they will look at us and they will know what it is like to be devoted to God, what it is like to make progress in our spiritual work, what it is like to care for others. And we pray that, Lord, as that happens, this church will also reflect that by living and pursuing the same things. Will you grow your church, Lord? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.